Chapter 4, La Pointe à Pan. Sometimes Jack Caraquazian missed the ancient, exquisite colours of the Egyptian evening, where shades of yellow, red and purple touched the warm stone of magnificent ruins, flooded the desert and brought deep shadows as black and sharp as flint upon that richly faded landscape, one subtle tint blending into another, one stone with the next, supernaturally married and near to their final gentle merging in the last sweet centuries of their material state. Here on the old Etoile, he remembered the glories of his youth before they drilled the fault, and he found some consolation, if not satisfaction, in bringing back a time when he had not known much in the way of self-discipline, had gloried in his talents, when he had seemed free. Once again, he strove to patch together some sort of consistent memory of when they had followed the map into the Cypress Swamp, of times when he had failed to reach the swamp. He had a sense of making progress up the trace after he had disembarked, but he had probably never reached McClellan, and had never seen the stains again. How much of this repetition was actual experience? How much was dream? Recently, the semi-mutable nature of the Matrix meant that such questions had become increasingly common. Jack Caraquazian had countless memories of beginning this journey to join her and progressing so far, usually no closer than Vicksburg, before his recollections became uncertain and the images isolated, giving no clue to any particular context. Now, however, he felt as if he were being carried by some wise momentum, allowing his unconscious to steer a path through the million psychic turnings and cul-de-sacs this environment provided. It seemed to him that his obsession with the woman, his insane association of her with his luck, his muse, was actually supplying the force needed to propel him back to the reality he longed to find. She was his goal, but she was also his reason. Chapter 5, Le Veuf de la Coulée They had met for the third time while she was still with Van Beek, the brute said to own half Tennessee and to possess the mortgages on the other half. Van Beek's red stone fortress lay outside Memphis. He was notorious for the cruel way in which his plantation whites were treated, but his influence among the eight states of the Confederacy meant he would inevitably be next Governor-General with the power of life and death over all but the best protected Machinoy, or guild neutrals like Jack Caraquazian and Kalinda de Vero. I am working for him, she admitted, as a kind of ambassador. Well, you know how squeamish people are about dealing with the North. They lose face even by looking directly at a whitey. But I find them no different in the main, a little feckless, social conditioning. She did not hold with genetic theories of race. She had chatted in this manner at a public occasion where, by coincidence, they were both guests. You are his property, I think, Mr. Caraquazian had murmured without rancour, but she had shaken her head. Whether she had become addicted to Van Beek's power or was merely deeply fascinated by it, Mr. Caraquazian never knew. For his own part, he had taken less and less pleasure in the liaison that followed while still holding profound feelings for her. Then she had come to his room one evening when he was in Memphis, and she in town with Van Beek, who attended some bond auction at the big hotel, and told him that she deeply desired to stay with him. So they, but they must be so rich they would never lose their whole role again. Mr. Caraquazian thought she was ending their affair on a graceful note. Then she produced a creased readout which showed colour sightings in the depths of Mississippi near the Tom Bigby. Not far, not far from Starkville. This was the first evidence she had ever offered him, and he believed now that she was trying to demonstrate that she trusted him. She was telling the truth. She had intercepted the report before it reached Van Beek. The airship pilot who sent it had crashed in flames a day later. This time we go straight to it. She had pushed him back against his cot, sniffing at his neck, licking him. Then, with sudden honesty, she told him that, through her tarot racing, 
She was into Van Beek for almost a million guineas, and he was going to make her go north permanently to pay him back by setting up deals with the white bosses of the so-called insurgent republics. Van Beek's insults are getting bad enough. Imagine suffering worse from a white man. Within two weeks, they had repeated their journey up the trace, got as far as McClellan and taken a pirogue into the streams, following as best they could the grey contours of the aerial map, heading towards a cypress swamp. It had been fall then, too, with the leaves turning. The tree-filled landscapes of browns, golds, reds and greens reflected in the cooling sheen of the water. The swamp still kept its heat during the day. We are the same, he had suggested to her to explain their love. We have the same sense of boredom. No, Jack, we have the same habits, but I arrived at mine through fear. I had to learn a courage that for you was simply an inheritance. She had described her anxieties. It occasionally feels like the victory of some ancient winter. The waterways were full of birds which always betrayed their approach. No humans came here at this time of year, but any hunters would assume them to be hunting too. Beautiful as it was, the country was forbidding, and with no trace of Indians, a sure sign that the area was considered dangerous, doubtless because of the snakes. She foresaw a world passing from contention to warfare, from warfare to brute struggle, from that to insensate matter, and from that to nothingness. This is the reality offered as our future, she said. They determined they would, if only through their mutual love, resist such a future. They had grown comfortable with one another, and when they camped at night they would remind themselves of their story, piecing it back into some sort of hole, restoring to themselves the extraordinary intensity of their long relationship. By this means, and the warmth of their sexuality, they raised a rough barrier against encroaching chaos. Chapter 6 Monsoir et mon amour It had been twilight, with the cedars turning black and silver, a cool mist forming on the water when they had reached the lagoon marked on the map, poling the dugout through the shallows, breaking dark gashes in the weedy surface, the mud sucking and sighing at the pole. Each movement tired Mr. Karakwazian too much, threatening to leave him with no energy in reserve, so they chose a fairly open spot where snakes might not find them and placed a variety of sonic and visual beacons, settled down to sleep. They would have slept longer had not the novelty and potential danger of the situation excited their lusts. In the morning, sitting with the canvas folded back and the tree-studded water roseate from the emerging sun, the mist becoming golden, the white ibises and herons flapping softly amongst the glowing autumn foliage, Jack Caraquazian and Kalinda de Vero breakfasted on their well-planned supplies, studying their map before continuing deeper into the beauty of that unwelcome swamp. Then at about noon, with a cold blue-grey sky reflected in the still surface of a broad shallow pond, they found colour. One large stain, spread over an area almost five feet in circumference, and two smaller stains about a foot across, almost identical to those noted by the pilot. From a distance, the stains appeared to rest upon the surface of the water, but as Mr. Karakwazian pulled the boat closer, they saw that they had in fact penetrated deeply into the muddy bottom of the pond. The gold stains formed a kind of membrane over the openings, effectively sealing them, and yet it was impossible to tell if the colour was solid or a kind of dense, utterly stable gas. Somebody drilled here years ago, and then, I don't know why, thought better of it. Kalinda looked curiously at the stains, mistaking them for capped bores. Yet it must be a first quality, near pure. Jack Karakwazian was disappointed by what he understood to be a note of greed in her voice, but he smiled. There was a time colour had to come out perfect, he said. This must have been drilled before Biloxi, or around the same time. Well, now they're too scared, most of them, to drill at all. Shivering, she shared up 
She peered over the side of the boat, expecting to see her image in the big stain, and instead was surprised, almost shocked. Watching her simply for the pleasure it gave him, Jack Karakwazian was curious and moved his own body to look down. The stain had a strangely solid, unreflective depth, like a gigantic ingot of gold hammered deep into the reality of the planet. Both were now aware of a striking abnormality, yet neither wanted to believe anything but some simpler truth, and they entered into an unspoken bond of silence on the matter. We must go to Jackson and make the purchase, he said. Then we must look for some expert engineering help, another partner even. This will get me clear of Van Beek, she murmured, her eyes still upon the stain. That's all I care about. He'll know you double-crossed him as soon as you begin to work this. She shrugged. At her own insistence, she had remained with the claim while he went down to Jackson to buy the land, and when this was finalised by a prospecting licence, without which they would not be able to file, such were Mississippi's bureaucratic subtleties. Subtleties. But when he returned to the Cypress Swamp, she and the pirogue were gone. Only the stains remained as evidence of their experience. Inquiring frantically in McClellan, he heard of a woman being caught wild and naked in the swamp, and becoming the common possession of the brothers Burger and their father Ox until they tired of her. It was said she could no longer speak any human language, but communicated in barks and grunts like a hog. It was possible that the Burgers had drowned her in the swamp before continuing on up towards Tapello where they had property. Chapter 7 Vals de Soix Convinced of their kidnapping and assault upon Kalinda de Vero, of their responsibility for her insanity and possibly her death, Jack Karakwazian was only an hour behind the burghers on the trace when they stopped to rest at the Breed Papoose. The Mendala Tavern just outside Belgrade in Chickasaw Territory was the last before Mississippi jurisdiction started again. It served refreshments as rough and new as its own timbers. A ramshackle, unpainted shed set off, set off the road in a clearing of slender firs and birches. Its only colour was its sign. The crude representation of a baby, black on its right side, white on its left, and wearing Indian feathers. Usually Jack Karakwazian avoided such places, for the stakes were either too low or too high, and a game usually ended in some predictable brutality. Dismounting in the misty woods, Mr Karakwazian took firm control of his fury and slept for a little while before rising and leading his horse to the hitching post. A cold instrument of justice, the Egyptian entered the tavern, a mean, unclean room where even the sawdust on the floor was filthy beyond recognition. His weapon displayed in an obvious threat. He walked slowly up to the Mendala sodden bar and ordered a frum. The two burghers and their huge sire were drinking at the bar with every sign of relaxed amiability, like creatures content in the knowledge that they had no natural enemies. They were honestly surprised as Jack Karakwazian spoke to them, his voice hardly raised, yet cutting through the other conversations like a mason knife. Ladies are not so damned plentiful in this territory we can afford to give offence to one of them, Mr Karakwazian had said, his eyes narrowing slightly, his body still as a hawk. And as for hitting one or cursing one, or having occasion to offer harm to one, or even murdering one, well, gentlemen, that looks pretty crazy to me, or if it isn't craziness, then it's dumb cowardice, and there's nobody in this here tavern thinks a whole lot of a coward, I believe. And even less, I'd guess, of three damned cowards. At this scarcely disguised challenge, the majority of the Breed Papoose's customers turned into discreet shadows until only Mr. Karakwazian and his dusty silks and linen, and the burghers, still in their travelling caftans, their round Ugandan faces, bright with sweat, were left confronting one another along the line of the plank bar. Mr. Karakwazian made no movement until the burghers fixed upon a variety of impulsive actions. The Egyptian did not draw as Jaff Burger ran for the darkness of the back door convenience. 
Neither did his hand begin to move as Archburger flung himself towards the cover of an overturned bench. It was only as Pa Ox, still mildly puzzled, pulled up the huge Vickers 9 on its swivel holster that Mr. Karakwazian's right hand moved with superhuman speed to draw and level the delicate silver stem of a pre-rip Sony, cauterizing the old burger's gun hand and causing his terrible weapon to crash upon stained, warped boards. To slice away the bench around the shivering arch, who pulled back withering fingers with a yelp, and to send a slender beam of lilac carcinogens to ensure that Jaff would never again take quite the same pleasure in his private pursuits. Then the gambler had replaced the Sony in its holster and signalled with a certain embarrassment for a drink. From the darkness, Archburger said, Can I go now, mister? Without turning, Karakwazian raised his voice a fraction. I hope in future you'll pay attention to better advice than your pa's, boy. He looked directly into the face of the wounded ox who turned, holding the already healing stump of his wrist to make for the door, leaving the vicars and the four parts of his hand in the sawdust. I never would have thought that Sony was anything but a woman's weapon, said the barkeep admiringly. Oh, you can be sure of that, Jack Karakwazian lifted a glass in crisp cryptic salute. Chapter 8. Les Flammes d'Enfer It had been, perhaps a month later, still in the territory that Mr. Karakwazian had met a man who had seen the burghers with the mad woman in Aberdeen, a week before Jack Karakwazian had caught up with them. The man told Mr. Karakwazian that Ox Burger had paid for the woman's board at a hotel in Aberdeen. Burger had made sure a doctor was found and a woman hired to look after her, until her folks came looking for her. The man had spoken in quiet wonder of her utter madness, the exquisite beauty of her face, the peculiar cast of her eyes. Ox told me she had looked the same since they'd found her, wading waist-deep in the swamp. From Aberdeen, he heard, she had been taken back to New Auschwitz by Van Beek's people. In Memphis, Mr. Karakwazian learned she had gone north. He settled in Memphis for a while, perhaps hoping she would return and seek him out. He was in a state of profound shock. Jack Karakwazian refused to discuss or publicly affirm any religion. His faith in God did not permit it. He believed that when faith became religion, it inevitably turned into politics. He was firmly determined to have as little to do with politics as possible. In general conversation, he was prepared to admit that politics provided excellent distraction and consolation to those who needed them but such comfort was usually brought at too high a price. Privately, he held a quiet certainty in the manifest power of good and evil. The former he personified simply as the deity. The latter he called the old hunter, and imagined this creature stalking the woods in search of souls. He had always congratulated himself on the skill with which he had avoided the old hunter's traps and enticements, but now he understood that he had been made to betray himself through what he valued most, his honour. He was disgusted and astonished at how his most treasured virtues had destroyed his self-esteem and robbed him of everything but his uncommon luck at cards. She did not write. Eventually he took the etoile down to Baton Rouge, and from there rode the Omnus, towards the coast by way of McComb and Wiggins. It was easy to find Biloxi. The sky was a fury of purple and black for 30 miles around, but above the fault was a patch of perfect pale blue, there since the destruction began. Even as Continua collided and became merely elemental, you could always find the Terminal Cafe, flickering in and out of a thousand subtly altering realities, pulsing expanding, contracting, pushing unlikely angles through the afterimages of its own shadows, making unique each outline of each ordinary piece of furniture and equipment, and yet never fully affected by that furious vortex above which the solar system bobbed, as it were, like a cork at the centre of the maelstrom. They were not entirely invulnerable to the effects of chaos, that 
pit of non-consciousness. There were the hot spots, the time shifts, the perceptual problems, the energy drains, the odd geographies. Heavy snow had fallen over the delta one winter, a general cooling, a coruscation, while the following summer most agreed was perfectly normal. And yet there remained always that sense of borrowed time. She had seen the winter as an omen for the future. We have no right to survive this catastrophe, she had said. Yet we must try, surely. He had recognised a faith as strong as his own. She spoke one night of the nation of angels and of worlds ruled by all that was best and wisest, law and chaos balanced and harmonious. You must learn to find harmony, Jack, she said. Why, well, I believe I have it, he had responded seriously without a hint of irony. I believe I have conquered what is dishonourable or base within me. It is not conquest, I mean, she said. There is a jackal in you, Majoli. That jackal is a symbol of all that you believe, the noblest of your instincts, and it is your greatest aid to survival. Don't listen to the jackal, darling. You must listen only to your heart. He had heard the singing rhythms of her words, almost swooning in the seductive music of them, the thrilling delight of the sound alone. The meaning came vaguely to him, but he guessed it to be some reciprocated sentiment that would be modified by morning light. One day, Jack, you will have to leave the beast behind. Baudreau Ramsadine brought in a new band, Electroc Adepts, from somewhere in Tennessee, where they'd found a hot spot and brained it until it went dry. They had been famous in those half-remembered years before the fault, and they played with extraordinary vigour and pleasure, so that Baudreau's strange, limping dance took on increasingly complex figures, and his partners, thrilled at the brute's exquisite grace and gentleness, threw their bodies into rapturous invention, stepping in and out of the zigzagging after-images, sometimes dancing with twin selves, their heads flung back and the colours of hell reflected in their duplicated eyes. And Baudreau cried with the joy of it, while Jack Caraquazian on the raised game floor, where the window looked directly out into the fault, took no notice. Here at this favourite flat game, his fingers played a ten-dimensional pseudo-universe like an old familiar deck. The Egyptian still presented his back to that voracious fault, its colours swirling in a kind of glee. It swallowed galaxies while Mr. Caraquazian gave himself to old habits. But he was never unconscious. Mr. Caraquazian remained in the limbo of the terminal cafe. Up in Memphis, he heard bloody rivalries and broken treaties would inevitably end in the Confederacy's absolute collapse, unless some sort of alliance was made with the reluctant free states. Either way, wars must begin. Kalinda de Vero's vision of the future had been clearer than most of the oracles. Mr. Caraquazian had left Egypt because of civil war. Now he refused to move on or even discuss the situation. He kept his back to the fault because he had come to believe it was the antithesis of God, a manifestation of the old hunter. Yet, unlike most of his fellow gamblers, he still hoped for some chance of reconciliation with his deity. His faith had grown more painful, but was not diminished by his constant outrage at his own obscene arrogance, which had led him to ruin innocent men. Yet something of that arrogance remained, and he believed he would not find any reconciliation until he had rid himself of it. He knew of no way to confront and redeem his action. To seek out the burghers, to offer them his remorse, would merely compound his crime shift the moral burden and, what was more, further insult them. He remembered the mild astonishment in Ox's eyes. At last, he understood the man's expression as Ox sought to defend himself against one whom he guessed must be a psychopath blood looking for a coup. Sam Oakenhurst wondered, in the words of a new song he had heard, if they were not killing time for eternity. 
Maybe one by one they would get bored enough with the game and stroll casually down into the mouth of hell to suffer whatever punishment, pleasure or annihilation was their fate. But Mr. Karakwazian became impatient with this, and Sam apologised. Well, I'm growing sentimental, I guess. Mr. Oakenhurst and Brother Ignatius had borrowed two of his systems for the big Texas game. They had acted out of goodwill, attempting to re-involve him in the things which had once pleased him. Mr. Oakenhurst had told of an illegal acoustic school in New Orleans, only a few people still had those old, cruel skills. Well, why don't you meet me down there, Jack, when I get back from Texas? They're treacherous dudes, these machinois, outlaws or otherwise. Well, what's the difference, Jack? It'll make a change for you. When he had first entered the American interior, Jack Karakwazian found a familiar world in which all the details were alien. The bird cries were exotic. The greens of the live oaks and the pecans, the magnolias, elms and black walnuts were subtly awry. The smells were too simple and then too complex. The animals were primitive in some species, highly evolved in others. The olive trees were actually mesquite. The blackberries had the bite of loganberries. The ibis were twice the size, while certain crows were vivid crimson or royal blue. Even in Africa, even in the revered city, the red city of Marrakesh, whose mountains were glazed with silver, whose palms were the most pardon me, whose palms were the most elegant in all Islam, whose palaces and mosques rivaled those of Egypt or Istanbul. Even there, the world had not seemed so thoroughly familiar or so utterly strange. It was unlike any Christian or Islamic world he had ever experienced yet a peculiar combination of them both. It had not taken Jack Karakwazian long to adapt to the easier, more formal manners of the Americans. Americans had a reverence, he perceived, for archetypes, and were slow to change. He was glad of the respite from the hurry and machismo of the Mediterranean cities, where politics had grown almost unbelievably volatile, never stabilising long enough for an idea to be tested but must ultimately simplify under longed-for dictatorship. The popular will over there was now a fascist will. The class struggle was already lost for the likes of himself. His class, the aristocratic gambling adepts, had dreamed itself out of power. When the Civil War came, he had no choice but to sail to New Orleans and take professional passage aboard a Mississippi steamboat, prepared to lose a fair percentage of his savings upon a study of the particular game played in those parts. He had learned quickly, and brought such a strange new perspective to his games that for a while he could do nothing but win, until they began to study him, and then at last he was playing with equals. Mr. Karakwazian did not always win, but he was one of the select number. Los Yugadors, the master gamblers, tended out of custom to keep company together when not engaged with the tables and, according to their preference, enjoy a miraculous kind of sexual congress in which their skills and experience were delightfully engaged. There was much to be said, he had decided, for such customs. The culture suited him, though he had a distaste for whites, which was hard to overcome. Many of these Americans treated their whites almost as friends, it seemed to him a dishonest relationship, perversely sentimental at best. But it was not his business to judge his hosts, and he was glad that the majority rarely judged him. He had a talent for adaptability on certain levels. All he required were the fundamental mathematics of the game, which he could enjoy playing. In his distant way, Mr. Karakwazian relished profoundly all life's experiences. Mr. Karakwazian was blessed with what his mentor had once described as a holy curiosity. He was also lucky that he had arrived in the region at a time when it was prosperous, liberal, ruled by an aristocratic intelligentsia which had a tradition of social conscience, enabling it usually to hold that important balance of power which kept society vital. But as rapidly as had happened in Spain, their paternalism had eventually decayed and lost power to a petty bourgeoisie which in the first waves of its conquest, was violently anti-intellectual, and which all but destroyed the old intellectual tradition. 
Then, having gained wealth, this new power began to cultivate the manners and traditions of its defeated rivals until, in no time at all, the old aristocracy was returned to power. When the sudden upheaval had first occurred, Jack Karakwazian and his friends saw their skills devalued, imitated in crude forms in a million arcades, as simplified and as vulgar as such imitations always are, until, on another turn of the wheel, back the traditional standards came again, and Mr. Karakwazian and his kind were heroes, able to re-establish all their old privileges. So familiar was the cycle that when their luck changed again, Jack Karakwazian and the others took almost no notice, but withdrew to weather the phenomenon. That was when the colour-greedy power barons had been talked into a crank experiment, designed to bore into the very soul of the universe. The deepest core of inexhaustible energy and live forever free on the proceeds of the profits. With a great deal of swagger and smart, authoritative language, the engineers set up equipment to put their slick theory into practice. And with alarming speed, they had created the Biloxi Fault, which, when it did not seem to be doing harm to this particular loop in the great web of time and space, drew tourists of every kind until Boudreaux Ramsadine saw a business opportunity, and having imagination only for music and catering, went up the line to Meridian and bought the terminal cafe and hotel, bringing it back in three parts on the monstrous flatbeds designed to move boats and homes across America. The massive gauges of the trains, the vast power of her steamers, enabled him to obey such whims. He thought the title of the place would bring him luck. It brought him luck and music and the legendary gamblers. After a while, the power ran out everywhere, except in Biloxi. Some subtle change had occurred, which altered the nature of electricity and made power sources difficult to find and unfamiliar in appearance. It would have seemed that the adepts, mostly deprived of their complex electronics, would cease to play their games. But the adepts, flexible of mind, bit by bit discovered and invented unimaginable substitutes for their electronics that conjured the same rich variety of invention, the same spiritual, intellectual, mathematical and emotional levels of play, with the use of touch and minute variations of sound to create communicable codes. It was an astonishing act of disciplined imagination on their part. Their skills and their brains adapted within a matter of years, evolving in ways which any scientist would insist must take millennia. Faced with such profound changes in the nature of things, Jack Karakwazian had had no choice but to continue acting upon his habitual assumptions. He played his hands and proceeded with his games as he had done since a youth amongst the great teachers of Alexandria in Marrakech. There, they had never doubted that God was a God of love and justice, of equity and logic. Yet they taught him how to give himself up to chaos, to the laws of chance, to play those complex electronic games in which the whole universes, species, and nations were created, sometimes down to the most ordinary individual, and then manipulated in a game which sometimes took decades of subjective time, only for a few minutes of the real time used by the Mukamidim, the Ugadors, the master gamblers of the holy order of Akmartin, who stood against and together with all the great gambling guilds. These were games of such complexity and subtle creativity, using the most exquisitely delicate electronics, or more recently pseudo-electronics, to create realities whose responsibilities and mathematics sometimes terrified even the most experienced of gamblers. It was not for nothing that they debated at their schools and in their gathering places the moral assumptions and burdens of those who followed their calling. Were they themselves no more than the creation of some other intelligence's momentary whim? Sometimes Jack Karakwazian would walk away from a game and go to an abandoned cabin about a mile inland on one of the old bayous. Sitting on the porch and enjoying the peace of the Mississippi evening, he might consider how the Egyptians had conquered nature so thoroughly that in the end they had poisoned to the very source of their existence, the Nile. Jack Karakwazian would give himself up to the music of the birds. 
the rhythms of the grasshoppers, the insects and reptiles which man's hands might never now eradicate. The adepts frequently discussed amongst themselves whether the reality they created in their games was any different from the reality they experienced. Were they themselves mere counters in some game played amongst the angels? Or had they also created the angels? They made worlds, universes, and then set events in motion which depended upon the actions of billions of pseudo-individuals. Did those individuals possess souls? Some thought so, but Mr. Karakwazian did not. He created histories which were challenged by rival histories from the other players. The winner was the adept whose reality withstood or assaults upon it. Every test, random or calculated, the other gamblers could marshal against them. But was there a place where the games continued to be played out beyond their control? Beyond their very imagining? A place of chaos? Mr. Karakwazian's metaphysics and maths were more practical and applied directly to his trade. He had no use for such unprovable speculation. After playing a few more hands on the edge of eternity, Mr. Karakwazian joins Mr. Oakenhurst in New Orleans. Brother Ignatius was gone, taken out in some freak pie jump on the way home, his horse with him. Mr. Karakwazian discovered the Mashinoi to be players more interested in remorseful nostalgia and the pain than the game itself. It had been ugly money, but easy, and their fellow players, far from resenting losses, grew steely more friendly courting the Yugador's company between games, offering to display their most intimate scarifications. Jack Karakwazian had wondered chiefly because of the terror he sensed resonating between them, if the Mashinoi might allow him a means of salvation, if only through some petty martyrdom. He had nothing but a dim notion of conventional theologies, but the Mashinoi spoke often of journeying into the Shadowlands, by which he eventually realised they meant an afterlife. It was one of their fundamental beliefs. Swearing he was not addicted, Sam Oakenhurst was able, amiably, to accept their strangeness and continue to win their guineas. But Mr. Karakwazian became nervous, not finding the dangers in any way stimulating. When his luck had turned, Mr. Karakwazian had been secretly relieved. He had remained in the city only to honour his commitment to his partner. He felt it might be time to try the trace again. He felt she might be calling him. <laughs>